Welcome once again to another episode of The Wall Behind and Beyond. I'm your host, Philip A. Jones. Today on the show, we have a brother who has literally gone from ghetto streets to executive suites in his bid for president of the United States. His passion for justice is fueled by his life experience. His campaign represents a movement that seeks to bring government back to its roots. His platform consists of throwing away with specific legislative acts such as the 1994 Crime Bill and the Habitual Offender Act, to name a few. With his slogan, Vision for America Freedom, he is going to speak with us about the meaning of the Ballot or the Bars Initiative. I want to welcome Brother Andy Williams Jr., a.k.a. the Hood Candidate, to the show. How you holding, brother? Man, it's, 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 it's love over here, fam. Appreciate you for even having me on the, on the show. No doubt, no doubt. Absolutely, man. I'm hearing about what you're doing, so I want to get straight to it. Um, you know, I got some questions for you, um, and I know you got some answers for us, you know what I'm saying? So to begin, you know, tell us a little bit about your background and where you're from. Uh, I'm from Aurora, Illinois. It's the second largest city in Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Um, it ain't really so large, you know, compared to Chicago. It's about 200,000 strong. I grew up with my mother and uh, my father. Um, but my stepmom, I had a stepmom, let me say that. My mother and father, biological mother, separated from my pops when I was two. I went to go stay with my dad, me and my older brother. He started dating a German lady. We we would call her white, but, you know, I'm a brother that believe in nationalities. And so when he started, you know, dating her, they got a house on the east side. Um, grew up in a middle class home, had school chore, school clothes, play clothes, chores, um, straight A B student, had a violin, saxophone, piano in our house, uh, went to Germany when I was seven. You know, it, it was tight on, you know, what was the resources around, but my pops was always working. He had his own construction business. So my stepmom, which really that's my mom, one of my mom's OG. She was a disciplinarian, authority figure, the nurturer. She played a lot of roles. And with me and my older brother, she was barely old enough to even be my mom based on numbers and definitely not old enough to be my brother's mom. But she did a great job, you know, raising us up. But then uh, her and my pop split when I was 12. And I was always, you know, itching to get into these streets because growing up, you know, the my classmates, older brothers, you know, was in gangs and I just thought it was cool. Not like, you know, no protection stuff. So I kind of gravitated towards that. Unfortunately, I was gravitating towards the, what we would know, you know, as ops. Cause I grew up around the Latinos, but in middle school, I was mm -hmm. around, you know, gangster disciple. And I just gravitated mm -hmm. towards that. And it took me down a journey. And from there with that journey, uh, a gangster disciple, I, you know, easily rose up based on my foundation, got a leadership position. Um, and it it, it just kind of like took off from there. But then the blueprint came out and I, I kind of like applied those principles. I mean, I went to prison for strong arm robbery. The lieutenants uh, of the police department wife chain got snatched, which I didn't do that. But I was on another mm -hmm. case where they put that on me. I went to the joint, did like 13 months total. As soon as I got out the joint, I get popped off on a dope case um, that was only out three months. And uh, I'm from the old school. I'm 51. I was trading some dope for some guns. It was a setup. So my homie was at the crib with me when they raided the house. I confessed to the dope, you know, so my mans would get off, which he did. But then I get mm -hmm. caught up with an elder. He told me to go to the law library. And if I never would have made the statement, I'd have beat the case. Boom, I get the statement mm -hmm. suppressed, took it to a bench trial, beat the case in a bench trial. Unheard of, but I did. And that kind of like gave me a, a passion for the law, which once mm -hmm. I get out from beating this case, I spent 11 months. I go to the law library for like four months and the lady Nancy and Holly was my teachers and I learned everything about the dope gang. And, you know, when mm -hmm. I talk about how I walked off them streets from that, that negative lifestyle, it was because of the blueprint from, you know, Gangster Disciple to Growth and Development under the Honorable mm -hmm. Chairman Larry Hoover, which I never met personally. But I took that, you know, and applied those principles to my life. And that's how I kind of like evolved um, into becoming, you know, the man I am today. I got married, went to church, 
got ordained as a deacon, just took this this route, really got involved in the community to uproot the negative, you know, lifestyle I was living. I had a still do got name on the streets, but uh it was a negative name back then and I flipped that script around. Man. Hey man, that's dope, man. I, I, I'm listening and I'm seeing it I, as you're talking. You you went full circle, man. That was a 360 degree turn that you did. But a lot of people don't understand. You can come from that background. You started off stable, but you can come from that background, entering into the gang lifestyle, and then turning the negative. You talked about growth and development, so you turned the negative into a positive, and look at look at you now. And so your trajectory, man, seems to be set up strictly for your success, you know, even though you had to go through these things, because I myself went through the same things, and I understand it very well. So I appreciate you for breaking that down for those that might be listening that don't understand that, that, that man, sometimes circumstances in our lives, they shape us. You know what I mean? Our experiences make us who we are. So thank you for breaking all that down and telling us a lot, a lot about you. You know what I mean? Now we got a better scope on where it is that you're going today. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So uh, let me get to the next question. From your bio, I see that you were running for president of the United States. What was your motivation to do this? It was a uh, it was a calling. You know, I believe in the one we call God, you know, Yahweh, from a Hebrew Israelite standpoint. And on May 3rd, uh, 2019, I, I get I get that voice like. Hey, son, would you consider running for president? And because of the evolution I had, I, I know when the spirit is talking, because that never was in 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 written in my vision to even be on. I mean, it, politics was part of the blueprint, but it's not something that I, you know, ever aspi- and, uh, aspired to be. And so I was like, I bet. And that was May 3rd, 2019. But I just want to back up a little bit before that, because... Mm-hmm. After I get up out them streets, I started selling cars and then I wind up owning a mortgage company. And in the mortgage mm-hmm. company, you know, I built this drug. I'm making a million a year, you know, straight off the street from selling dope to, you know, giving hope with these mortgages. And mm-hmm. then I got the foreclosure crisis hit and it was a bogus foreclosure on me, but I fought the bank for 13 years. So I self-educated myself on the collapse of the economy back in 2008. So I knew about mortgage mm-hmm. servicing, pooling and service agreement, trust. I mean, I'm dealing with Bank of New York, Mellon, Deutsche Bank, and I'm suing all these cats in the Fed court for RICO, you know, because this is how I had evolved. You know, I started building people's law firms. Um, and so I, I share that part because during that time, you know, I wound up being on TV with a, a WTTW PBS and I'm calling Barack Obama out just for the fact that if you come from a community organizer and hear these banks done, you know, destroy people's lives, how would you bail, why bail them out instead of taking care of the people? Like it's a backwards oh, no. concept, you know? And so, uh, <clears throat> so I, I share that part because it comes in to how I started running for president 2019, February 13th, uh, my homie, Gary Martin, I think it was maybe, no, February 15th after Valentine's Day, he was a mass shooter. And he he really led a slave revolt, you know, a Nat Turner. Um, but he shot and killed five people at this job in Henry Pratt in Aurora, Illinois. Mm-hmm. Then he shot six police officers. And then the family called on me. So I go, you know, to my man's house, talk to him, and I get back involved in the community, ugly, heavy, you know, even to the, the family of those that had transitioned, I'm trying to reach out to them. And so this whole process of me getting back in the community, I kind of got focus off and then my bank account got low and I get this, you know, whistle like, yo, what's up? We lonely over here. And that's mm-hmm. when the spirit called me. It was like, would you consider running for president? And that's because now I done had a whole experience of solution from gangs to drugs, uh, my little brother died on an opioid overdose. Um, my other little brother, I mean, is skeptical with the family, but surely committed suicide because of his lifestyle. He felt rejected. So I really came to the campaign with a personal experience. And I could just hear or, or reading from the scriptures, you know, how God would allow things to happen to us 
to prepare us for where we at today. You know, I consider us being a Joshua generation. So that led up to when, you know, the spirit called me, especially I had started doing a lot of research on history, the 42 laws of Maya, just really bombarding my mind, uh, unlearning some of the things that I had learned. I was like, those fundamental truths are not fundamentally true because it's not working. You know, a lot of things I was learning in the church, it wasn't working. So I'm like, yo, what do you mean just trust God? No, I got a spirit in me. And so that's what a power, I started tapping into me, the greater that is he that is in me. And that's when I was running for president. It kind of was like, you got to go up against this, this system. I had no clue about nothing. But like everything else, I just started learning. You know, I self-educated myself. So I uh, came out as an independent. I joined the Libertarian Party, did several debates, made a lot of good friends with people. Um, and then in the end, I switched it back to being independent um, because once I started, I had to finish it. And, you know, I probably got like 17 votes knowingly that I got, you know, cast across the states were saying, man, we wrote you in because I was a write-in candidate. But after that election, I wound up suing, you know, the United States and 31 states for the ongoing role of slavery. Because, see, I'm not yeah. the type of typical candidate that says, if you elect me, this is what I'm going to do. I'm the type of candidate that's saying, this is morally wrong what you're doing, and we got to handle this irregardless of the vote. You know, mm -hmm. most people after they, you know, November 4th, 2020, come November 5th, they don't win, they platform go out the door. Not mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, we just getting started now. So that's kind of the move <laughs> yeah. I'm at, you know, with the presidential Absolutely. run, the first one, the first one, because I'm in it again. A second time. Already. Um, hey man, I seen the pivot uh that you made and um and that's what we gotta do. Like we got to evolve. And when you was talking about, you know, unlearning things, it kinda it jumped in my mind because we've been programmed to think in a certain kind of way. And so a lot of people don't have the abilities uh, necessary to unlearn. You know, we always trying to learn. We always studying and reading it, a lot of us. But do you know how to unlearn and reprogram your brain? Because of all the stuff that's been put in there, a lot of times you're thinking wrong. And then you don't realize it until you meet certain circumstances and you come up against it and you wonder why your, your outcome is bad. It's because you think wrong before you even enter a situation. And so that was a powerful thing that you said, and I'm glad you pointed that out, man. That's real. You got, you you use the term abolitionist, and a lot of people might not know what that stands for, what that means, especially when you hear people talking about criminal justice and all this stuff all the time. Can you speak to our listeners about what it means to be an abolitionist? So I, I'll go back to many of us uh, know about Frederick Douglass, you know, born a slave and got freedom. And then once he got his freedom, he went back as an abolitionist, meaning we got to end slavery, you know. And so me from an abolitionist is saying, I'm born free. My rights don't come from the government. It comes from God. So all these policies out here need to be abolished because they're infringing upon my rights or they're depriving me of my rights. And so when I sued the United States in 31 states, initially the suit was coming out saying, you know, you, you, uh, the 13th Amendment needs to be um, amended because I was big in that movement. movement. But then I also was mm -hmm. saying that this is infringing upon my uh, religious freedom and some other things that, that I was saying. Mm -hmm. But from that lawsuit and just learning, bro, you know, I you can already know, Brother Philip, I, I don't just do no surface study and I'm trying to get to the root of it. And mm -hmm. so when I was able to really comprehend what that uh, 13th Amendment meant that you can be duly if you've been duly convicted of a crime, you can be put into involuntary servitude. It's not what we see today. What today is Section 2 of the 13th Amendment, which caused a badge and incident of slavery. That means now you mm -hmm. pass some policies and legislation to put us de facto back into slavery. Mm -hmm. But this is what was abolished from the 13th Amendment. And so now we think and I'm saying this from all aspects, you know, every angle that if I get convicted for a crime, I can become, you know, work for pennies on a dollar. No, bro, because we're not being convicted of crimes. We're being brought in under statutes and codes and public policy. And public policy ain't law. Legislation is not law. You can never vote 
on my rights. That's not up for a vote because that way you can make law whenever you get the majority of the people in, in office or something. And so I challenged that from there. And that's how I wind up evolving. And when I sued the 31 states, they just came back and said, listen, you don't have standing. You know, your religious freedom don't work. And, you know, I smiled at it because now I got the blueprint, you know, and that all that ties into where I'm at today saying I'm not coming off with no angle about if you elect me, this is what I'm going to do. I'm coming with the angle. I comprehend the solution and I know it's going to take all of us. And when we when people talk about criminal justice reform, I respect that that's where they at mentally. But my mind is saying we abolishing the prison industrial complex. If you ain't never been injured, meaning the states, you don't have standing to bring a claim against we the people, because that's what they kept telling me. You don't have standing to sue on behalf of others. And I'm saying, well, look, I don't come across this decision that said even the prosecutor has to have an injury you know, personal to him to bring a claim against somebody. And what these states mm. have done have become corporations and a corporation can never be injured. So they're no longer sovereign states. So we back on the other side with my brother um, and he was giving us something deep. Um, you got any more things that you want to add to that before I move on? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of um, and I speak to speak to some of the elders. So I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on a factual thing. A lot of people don't understand Clarence Thomas. In fact, I wrote it today on my board, uh, the great Clarence Thomas. And then the, the tagline under it is misunderstood. Because see, Clarence mm-hmm. Thomas is saying you don't have civil rights. Do away with that. And the reason why is we don't have civil rights. That's something the government gives us. We have unalienable rights that's given to us by nature's God and the creator. And so what Clarence mm-hmm. Thomas and these decisions that I've read, and there's others too, is he's just not the one, but I'm I'm choosing him because the brother is breaking it down, saying these legislative courts are unconstitutional. In fact, in one of the decisions he had, he said they're dressed up as courts. They're not real mm-hmm. courts. They lack Article 3 standing, which means you have to have an injury in order to bring a claim. So now I'm going to pull this whole thing around specifically with the Chevron deference case that just came down from the Supreme Court that says, listen, these administrative agencies, it's a violation of separation of powers because you got an administrative agency acting like a judge stepping into a role they wasn't created to do. And that's where our freedom is coming in. So, you know, I'm, I'm sharing it out to all the listeners. Don't think Andy is running for president as a solution to set the captives free. That's my ministry, and that's going to get done, like El Haj Malik Shabazz say, by any means necessary. We're born for this. This is just to help people become aware that our generation needs to run for office, as Marcus Garvey would say, never ask somebody to do for you what you ought to do for yourself. We got to stop yeah. asking those that don't have the lived experience, the lifestyle, the allies them the ones that we need to be running but these other ones that's running to be part of that system aligning themselves with it i'm gonna tell you take a good example from the amish they ain't part of that world system bro they doing the thing on their own and that's what we need to be as with our generation with a unity and faith though you know muslims arabs hindus listen if you about liberation and freedom man we abolish all this stuff bro Mm -hmm. that's real I was uh, before we got, uh, got cut off. I was thinking about something that you said when you talked about solutions. And speaking of them, when I had a guy, he came and he said, he said, he said, uh, man, you know, we talk about this, you know, and we know the problems. He said, man, and uh, now what though? Where, where do we go from here? And he said, this, you know, it's a lot of rhetoric. And at first, when I read what he was saying, I kind of took offense to it because I thought. You still got to shine a light on a, on an issue, because if you don't, it's just going to get swept under the rug regardless. So of course, you need plans of actions and solutions. Of course, you need to stop talking about it and be about it. I said, but understand, those of us who are behind these walls, we see what's going on, and we feel it, just like you do. But you, But the difference is you're out there in the world. And so you can rally the troops, and you can put together coalitions, and you can attack the issue. If you need a solution, ask me for it. I got it. But at the same time, don't say, why are we still talking about it? Because there ain't no actions taking place. And so it's, 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 a, it's one of them things when it comes to unification. Um, everybody has a role to play. Some people spoke about the issues. Some mm-hmm. people eloquently some people eloquently articulated the issues. And then they had other people out there that was 
going on and enforcing those those solutions and making sure that the people was involved. And so there's many different roles to play. And so we got to understand that because I know it's frustrating. And so that's why people lash out or people say things that they don't really understand what they're saying. But I didn't mean to go off on a tangent on that, but I wanted to get your uh, your thoughts about things like that. So um, I just believe that everybody has a role to play. And one of the roles is we have a lot of people with the information about the problem and we talk about it, we teach about it, we post about it. But when it comes to actual implementation of the solution, that's not happening because what we're doing is we're, we're using the tools of our oppressors to bring forth liberation. Me doing litigation, I done sued Trump, I done sued Governor Prisca, Illinois, the mayors. Bro, I done went down the list with all these guys. I got a suit right now against the Department of Justice and the ATF on felons' right to bear arms. And I'm telling you, the Supreme Court is already in agreement with this. But I'm not saying that's the only solution. I'm saying what that does is it brings awareness to a brother that ain't waiting to sit at the table and have another discussion. This is a brother that's saying, I'm not going to talk to the legislators about what I want them to do. I'm saying, you the public servant. This is what you're supposed to do because the role of government in its limited form is to protect the rights of the people and the property, not infringe upon it. So we got to reverse this whole cycle. That's what I'm saying. We got to unlearn this. And so I respect those that are out here talking about criminal justice reform. But what I do is I'm rather align with the abolitionists and then come to connect with the activists and then partner with the advocates and then sit at the table with the attorneys and say, look, we got a five-fold cord that cannot be broken. We got blueprints that worked over here that may not work over there, but at least let's still put them out there. And in the same plan, and I'll close with this, I got a two full six plan. Every two years, 435 seats is up for election in the House of Representatives. We can run. Every four years, attorney generals, governors, presidents, they up for election. We can run for that. Every six years, the Senate. And if we do the 246 plan by year number seven, come on, bro. I ain't got, we know the math, the, 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 the math on that. You, you cannot Absolutely. continue to advocate using the same tools. You have to evolve. And when you evolve, you're going back studying what those that went before you did and did not do. One of my elders, brother Khalid, he always say the lessons I've learned and the mistakes that I made. So I'm saying I don't want to make the mistakes that you made. I want to learn from the lessons that you learned and I'm going to sit at the feet. So if you learn from the 60s movement, which they still alive from the Mexican Revolution, the Young Lords, uh, um, you got the hippies, the Jesus movement, you got all that. And it's for us to just sit there and learn and then go implement. I don't want to teach what they already went through. I share that, but I want to implement what I learned from sitting at the feet of them, from hearing from them. Like if I say we the the Joshua generation, that's the Moses generation. And I'm not trying to debate with them. The only thing that I ever disagree with coming to elders is the methods. And I say, we can't confuse the methods with the objectives. You have one way that you're going to do it, and I'm going to do it this way. But I'm not, we still want the same objective. It's freedom for all. My only thing is freedom is my birthright. Everything else, you infringing upon it. So I ain't advocating for my freedom. I'm telling you, you infringing upon my freedom and all those other similar that are situated, which I think is all the people. I think the, the, the individual that thinks they're a judge is really nothing but a judicial officer, an administrative law judge. They're bound by their thought process because they thought that they was a judge. No, bro, judges do law. Y'all doing legislation and legislation ain't law. You administrating codes and policies. Come on, fam. (laughs) They bound too. No doubt. Hey, man, um, I was thinking about that too as you were speaking is that a lot of us are, uh, we we passed our time. And sometimes, you know, like the old methods that they use, there's some parts of it that applies today, but as Mm -hmm. the, as society changes, um, and as we go into different eras, some things don't work. And so you got to take the parts that work. And then you you, um, you you bounce off of those or you uh, add on top of those, the foundation, because you, you can see it. If you got an old thought process and you're still trying to apply principles from the past and we're living in a new society 
and those things don't work no more, why are you still holding on to them? So another thing we got to do is stop holding on old ideas. Um, when it's time for fresh perspective, you know what I'm saying? Even these young people, bring them to the table. You know what I mean? Bring bring everybody to the table and let's sit, let's sift through the bullshit and let's try to bring about some uh, real cognitive, um, you know, issues that can be uh, put into a uh, performance. So, you know, again, man, um, I was going to ask you, what is the initiative, uh, the ballot or the bars? Can you break that down for me or uh, tell, the, tell the listeners what's that about? Right. Uh, so most people are familiar with uh, Malcolm X, which El Hash, uh, Malik Shabazz talked about the ballot or the bullet. And it always is around this election time where people come into the neighborhood and community saying, you know, vote for us. So Malcolm was like, look, we got to get the people with a heart from the community to run for office. Don't just come around here when it's time for election because we're getting shot. So use that ballot as your voice. So I'm saying the same thing, but in this terms, right now, everybody talking about this prison industrial complex, legalized slavery, or better terms for them, criminal justice reform. So if all of us as a class of people with lived experience, we know if we if the ballot is one of those tools, we can get people out of prison, meaning behind those bars, through the through the ballot. That's what we could do. And we also have to understand when I talk about the ballot of the bars, I'm saying it's people that are behind bars that ain't even physical bars. They mentally locked up out here walking around. I know I used to be one of them. So I'm not going to, you know, negate. That's a lived experience. So the ballot of the bars is saying the current and formerly incarcerated, as well as the natives, have the right to vote in a federal election because it's the states that's doing the disenfranchising. It's not the feds. So that's what the ballot of the bars is. And we're going to be bringing a suit against these certain states so that those that are behind the wall get to put their absentee ballot in and write the hood candidate and write me in or write whoever you want to write in for that ter- purpose. But I'm saying when you want to see somebody that's not talking about what he's going to do, you could just pull my background up and see what he's been doing. I've been doing this. This ain't, you know, I didn't just wake up one day and be like, oh, let me run for president to help the people. Mm-mm. Nah, bro. Ain't no, and there's not a, and, and I say this humbly and respectfully for those that are out there on the campaign trail, there ain't not one of these cats that got a resume coded in mind when it comes to protecting the rights of the people. There's not one. And that's because I'm born for this. That's the that's difference. Real. No doubt. It's a big difference. Uh, I love that, man. Um, you know, keep that up, man. And um, we all support you, man, because we need some changes. The people is taught of the status quo. Um, I don't even have to ask you um, if if you were president, what would your vision for America be? Because you didn't already broke that all down. Um, mm-hmm. But I do want to ask you, um, what do you what do you see um, happening um, in terms of this election cycle? In terms of and what does the people that's listening need to do in order to be involved in a way that's going to be constructive in terms of everything you laid out? So one, you can find more information about me at AWJ2024. So that's the campaign. The campaign website also take you to my hood candidate. The hood candidate is a brother say, we can't wait till November 5th. It's more than a vote. And then from there, I have a prisoner votes matter dot us, which it'll be on the hood candidate website when you go, because they all linked in. Everyone is linked in. And so when we're looking at what's going to happen, um, yesterday I kind of was like, you know what? I didn't even make the ballot access for Illinois. And for a second, I was like, you know what? I think I'm putting too much energy into this. But then the ancestors, like they always do, begin to speak to me and say, hold on. They could write you in Illinois, but there's all these other states that you still have access to under their system. And don't forget the suit that you're going to file. See, mm-hmm. and what I believe, because I always look at the what if scenario. What if I did not win? Just say, because this is not the time that the creator set it out for me. But we picked up more people on the journey. And I'm cool with that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not winning because, you know, we, we got the popular vote or the majority of the vote. I'm winning because I'm being obedient to what I was created to do. And that's the difference between me. You're not going to hear me doing no false promises about what I'm going to do because that's not written in the job description. The job description don't say you could do all that. But what the job description does say 
is the president declares what the law is. And what I declare the law is, is to be common law. That's the law of the land. So now we're dealing with torts. Torts are infractions against people. Criminal law are crimes against the state. And I'm saying all criminal law is unconstitutional. It's infringement of our unalienable rights. The states lack standing. This is what I mean by an abolitionist movement. We're doing away with the whole system as it pertains to that. And that's even traffic stops. That's taxes. Any fines or fees. Nah, bro. Mm -mm. And then all we do is look in my background and say, bro, this boy done sued everybody on this stuff. Say, why you didn't win? How could you win when I'm going to the court a system, A, but the real reason why I don't win, because the creator said, not yet, son. That's why. Ain't nobody got no authority over me other than the one that created me. And that's what I really believe by. So whatever I'm going through the journey, I'm not looking to please man. I'm looking to please the one that created me. And whatever that purpose was for, that's why I move according to the spirit and not according to what I see in the flesh. Because what's that's going to get me? Nothing. I'll be over here boohooing somewhere. Hey, I ain't raised no money. In it. Boy, please. Come on, man. Yeah. yeah. I ain't into all that. See, that, that, that definitely, then that's what stifles a lot of people's uh, ambitions because they got too much money in these politics and they got too much money in this prison industrial complex. And I was talking about that too, is that we got to defund that kind of stuff. Like prison shouldn't be for profit. And then that's mm -hmm. why it's so much uh, interest in them building more of them. They keep building them because it's, it's it's a profit system. Take away the profit, make it non-profit, and then see how much interest they have in it. So I love that part about what you just expressed. You ain't going off that motivation. Your motivation is for purpose and principle. So that's what's up. Um, that said, um, what would you like people to take away from this interview? Um, you know what I mean? I know you have some thoughts about that. So we want to hear that. Right. The one thing that I want everybody to understand is we have the power. We always hear power to the people. No, nah, the people have the power. We have the power. We, the people, have the power. And if you want to make real everlasting change, start with yourself. And when you start with yourself, if you're a parent, then you teach your children. That's what you do. Because we got a lot of us on the mass movements trying to be a part of the bigger thing. And I'm 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 in that. So I'm not saying no. But when the Chevron deference, uh, the Chevron the overturning of that came out, my oldest daughter, 30, boom, she sent my, me a video, said, Pops, man, you've been talking about this. My bonus son, because I'm remarried and, you know, my wife, she had two children prior to this. I'm teaching him the role of government. We're we going to do a whole course together. I told him about it yesterday, had him type it all up because I write, I wrote it down. That's where the real change starts with those in your immediate household. Because once you, you, once you can teach your family, bro, your family becomes the model. Mm -hmm. I'm not teaching something that I don't do. I'm not, I'm not out here sharing a message that I'm not applying to myself because the one thing that you can never vote about is family. And that's the fact. Family is something that we all desire, we all want, and we want it to look a certain way, and we're looking at the wrong models and examples, because if you don't see that model and example, be that model and example. And that's what I want us to know, man. We got the power to do whatever we want to do on this earth, as long as you ain't infringing upon somebody else's rights or somebody else's property. Don't use force. Don't use what your uh, oppressors taught you to be the way of the land created we're still creators we're, we're made in the image of creator and let your heart be the guide when it deals with love so we back on the side with the brother andy he's dropping a lot of gems for the people to digest and also unpack you know i just want to make sure that he has uh told us everything that he needs to tell us before we let this brother go. And so if you have any further words of uh, encouragement for the people or any information for final wording that you would like to impart, I'll, I'll ask you to do so now, brother, because, you know, we don't get a second chance sometimes, so we got to get it all out now, you know? 
Right. Uh, there's a song that, that popped in my mind when you said that, just hold on, you'll be coming home. And that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> just hold on, y'all. You coming home, bro. Real talk, you know. And um, for clarification purposes, when I talk about abolishing prisons, I'm not talking about doing away with accountability. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of times when we no. speak about abolishing prison, that's saying, well, anybody can get out. No, anybody cannot get out. Because if you're harmed to yourself or others, you need to be, you know, confined for safety. Because I do believe in public safety, but yeah. I don't believe the reason behind it is vengeance. That's the part that I don't have. And I understand that's going to take some time. We're going to have to unlearn some things. We're going to have to humble ourselves before we can heal ourselves. You got to humble yourself like first. That. I like that because it, it gives me uh, thoughts about restorative justice. And then the opponents, they like to say, well, so you just going to tear down the prisons and just let everybody go. I mean, that's not being realistic. Um, and that's not common sense because we already know that there's a lot of people who are not responsible. They have mm-hmm. a lot of mental illnesses. We got people mm-hmm. who, you know, like you said, every day they're thinking about who they can harm themselves or harm others. So we got something for that. But those are more, those are more, um, health issues as opposed to uh, criminalization because you can't criminalize mental health. Yes. So and that's, that's what they try to do a lot of times. So I'm glad you pointed that out because a lot of people listening who don't understand, they'll say, well, well what are we going to do if we just let everybody out and then isn't that? So they, 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 they like to muddy the waters with those what ifs and why would we want to do that and how will we fix this? And so you told them it's restorative justice, it's accountability, it's taking responsibility for those you harm, the actions you've caused that may have damaged someone else. And if that's the case, you ju- you display your remorse. Um, after your remorse, you show your redemption by, you know, doing something to make amends. And then there's healing because now you can be forgiven, you know what I'm saying, by your community right. and by those people that you cause harm to. So, yeah, brother, I want you to, you know, finish it off with that. But uh, I love that part, you know. Yeah, that's, that's the truth. You know, like, it just... Dr. Joy DeGroy, she's got this thing called post-traumatic slave syndrome. And she talks about mm-hmm. the generational trauma. She's talking about kinfolk, you know, people of color. Um, mm-hmm. But all of us have generational trauma. It's not just that, mm-hmm. you know, we, we all are bound in a belief system in some way or another. And because I believe in the creator, he created all the people. Mm-hmm. All the people don't went astray at some point. There ain't not one mm-hmm. person on this earth that has not went astray. So once you begin, because I p- part of my story is man love thyself. And once yeah. you begin to love yourself, I mean, like really, really g- understand what self-love is, then you begin to have empathy with other people because you see that they're still bound. You see they're still lost in a condition of a belief system. And mm-hmm. as Dr. King would say, you know, uh, what do you say? We all will be blind. If you pluck everybody eye out or something, if you if it's eye for an eye, then we all will be mm-hmm. blind. There's mm-hmm. things that happened in the past that I was not there. I don't know about. I don't know what was going on in the 1800s. I don't know. What I do know is I can't continue to live in the history that I've been taught about that because all we're going to mm-hmm. do is keep being in the wilderness for another 400 years, blaming it on somebody right. else. No, we in the wilderness right. because we broke the covenant with Yah. That's what we in the wilderness for, because we didn't want to take heed to the instructions that are talk about in Proverbs. And I'm not saying the Bible is a go off for everybody. I'm saying that's the principles that I apply by. That's me. You know, and if you got something mm-hmm. that you taking with, with you, what you learning through the Quran or, you know, the whatever it is, man, if it's working for you and, it, and I'm missing in that area, let me find out about that. Because in Buddhist monks, some no of them doubt. may understand peace. No doubt. Well, I'm going to sit at the That's table real. with them. You know what I'm saying? I ain't going to cut my hair like that, but I'm going to sit at the table and yeah. I'm going to learn from them. You know what I'm saying? We we got to stop saying, well, you're not following what I've been taught. So you, you I'm going to reject you. That's what the Heritage Foundation is saying with that Project 2025. But it still got good points in the Project 2025. So I'm not like throwing it all out the door just because, you know, it comes from a conservative Republican. And when they begin to understand, you'll be able to read. It ain't nothing about to understand. You'll be able to read how I'm going to start popping these habeas on behalf of what Clarence Thomas was saying. Because, see, that's yeah, what I'm going to yeah. do. 
I'm only coming with a habeas saying you unconstitutionally holding somebody because see the habeas is in the constitution, not your legislative codes and that's not there. You know, the constitution puts a limit on government. And every last one of us, which I'm not advocating for every last one of us, even though I know they're being held unconstitutionally. I know better than that. That's wisdom. But those, bro, man, if you ain't got no injured party behind that, you coming home. That's 60% of the doggone uh, uh, enslavement right now. 60% locked up for drugs. Mm. Locked up for possession of a firearm. The police job ain't to protect you. That's what the Second Amendment is for. So you can protect yourself and your family. So you can't tell me because I'm labeled as a felon, I don't have the right to protect myself because you're not protecting me. Oh, you done overstepped your boundaries, bro. I go with Cube. I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. But I'm not in that environment. Like I don't, for me, I don't, I don't, I don't need that. I, I move a different way. I ain't worried about all that. You know, not not for real, I'm not. Good, man. Uh, I like that, man. And I appreciate you, man, for what you're doing out there. Everybody has a role to play. Your voice is loud. Um, the things you're saying gonna resonate, um, because it's not the old cookie cutter. Um, you keep talking about the blueprint and um and that's what people need to um to learn about. So I'm hoping that, you know, people wrote down your information. I'm hoping that people uh took heed to your how to get a hold of you and get involved with you. And if you wanna put some more information out there about that, you know, feel free to do so. Because I want people to be able to get connected to you, and then if they can has, get involved and support you in any kind of way, to please feel free to do so. You know, right? All you gotta do is look up Hood Candidate, H W O D Candidate, and you'll find me. That that's 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 the name that's ringing. I love it. You know, um, I I branded it myself. Um, I was painting this lady house and doing her floor, and she said, "Let's do something different." She said, "Go get you a hoodie, cut the top." you know, cut the bottom off, put your suit on. And that's how the hood candidate was born. So I thank my sister, Sarah, for that. She branded it, bro. It's super cold because the hood candidate, uh, one, it talks about Yahshua, the one we know as Christ. He was in the hood. He went to where the people were. So it, it'll, it'll, it'll move from that. And then it's the sixties. You know, we restored a neighbor back to the hood back in the sixties. It was a whole lot of unity, you know, them street tribes, street organizations. It wasn't yeah. this 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 battling between each other that we see today. And then for yeah. right now with the politics, you need somebody that's got a heart from the hood, from the community that's relatable to all. Again, what I alluded to first, my stepmom is German, my wife Puerto Rican. Yeah. My brother had kids with a with a with a, a, a Mexican. We got the whole real rainbow at the crib when holidays come along, bro. I'm not into that divisive stuff based on your skin color, bro. That's not what I'm on. Your nationality and culture is yours. I can come break bread with you. I don't got to be like, oh, I'm going to eat the monkey brain just because I'm breaking bread with you. I don't want the monkey brain, but I'm still, hey, that's your culture. You, Hey, bro, that's you. And that's my heart to say, at least I get to have experiences that I would not have had if I didn't step outside, you know, what's been known as a comfort zone. And we got to step outside that. And I'm going to close just with this point. When I saw you on LinkedIn, I reached out to you, bro. You know what I'm saying? I saw what you was doing and followed up, said, hey, this is what I'm on, doing whatever I could do with the strength that I had. Here's the securities. Bam, I hit you up. And that's me. That's my character, though, bro. You know what I'm saying? I didn't say, well, are you, you know, you said, hey, I got this going on. I'm like, yeah, I'm looking into it. And then when you asked me, can I do that letter? And I said, man, bro, I'm not sure if that's what you really want, because I know the things that I'm doing is attacking the core of what's happening. And I don't want my affiliation to be with you to jeopardize something you're doing based on a letter. But you can best believe once I pull into this, you're going to come home with or without the letter because we got to the root of what's going on, which is legalized slavery. And that's the part that I see that I don't see nobody else really focusing on that, you know, going back to the abolitionist movement from the 1860s, where the Republicans were big proponent of that. Not all of them, but the majority of them were. And that's my heart now, saying I want to abolish everything that infringes upon our rights. I get to ear the Republicans. Um, some of them, I, I chair a board. So I'm, I'm more than just saying I know some. No, I'm chairing a board, you know. They reaching out to me for my legal mind with this group I'm a part of called New Illinois. So it's, you know, and that's just my heart to say, I realize we got to bring, everybody got to work together. It can't just be yeah. one. You can't, you can't just mess with your, your, who you familiar with. 
You're missing the whole part of being, you know, for my better terms, God's children. We are brothers and sisters in some form of way, even if I don't like you. And that's the human aspect of it. You know what I mean? Uh, we all one in the same, coming from the same source. We got to stop that because that's how they divide and conquer. Uh, when they when they when they separate people by race, gender, all that. You know what I mean? We got to open up our tents um, so that the people can come together uh, for some real solutions and some real peace. So thank you so much, brother, for coming through. Thank you for reaching out to me as you did. You definitely did that. I saw when you came through, you asked me, you know, I need some help. What, what was I doing? I remember that. And um, I was always thinking, you know what I mean? This brother, man, it didn't have to do that. So that means a lot to me. Um, so I, I support that and I appreciate that. That's, that's brotherhood, man. And, uh, right and we got to keep on promoting that. So have a, I mean, you know, take care, man. And I wish you the best on everything what you're doing. You need me. You already know where I'm at. Right on, right on. 